And the first kind of logical thing to use is first come first serve system. You just mm-hmm. log in, you say, okay, I want an appointment. You look for appointment and you say it's mine, right? So this, this is a free appointment. And this is a great system. It looks like, right? I mean, it provides a service for society. You don't have to go there. You don't have to queue. But mm-hmm. what, what happens when there is over demand, and this was one of the mm-hmm. first cases of that, is that scalpers, so black market develops. For them. There was a newspaper, a media coverage of the fact that a lot of people cannot get these appointments, but on the black market, you can buy them for five, $500. Wow. Things exploded. I mean, we started with a small application and then the thing exploded and we understood that essentially we solved mm-hmm. this issue for all of this application. And our solution is very simple intuitively. You know, if you want to go to, a, you know, a Sheeran's ticket uh, concept, yeah. it's also going to be underpriced because a Sheeran doesn't want to sell on at market price because it's probably going to be not many, you know, it will destroy his fan base or Champions yeah. League <laughs> final. Yeah. You don't want to have the richest one there because, you know, then people will just drink champagne and, and hardly clap <laughs> on the goals and you have to sell transmission rights. Welcome on this fifth episode of the Unbiased Podcast, the podcast about women and men of science, and more specifically, the podcast about scientific research in economics. Today, I'm really honored to have Rusta Makimov, assistant professor in tenure track at the University of Lausanne. And his research his work is at the, the frontier between experimental economics, behavioral economics, and, and also matching markets and market design. So those two last are, are really fields of research that I find fascinating. And really often when I have conversation with people telling me, but Scientific research is really obscure. It's just for, for academia, it's just for academics. It's useless. There are no application in real world. I usually pick examples from uh, market design because I think it's really a field that's applied and people very easily can understand how useful it is. And today will be a very good example. So later on, we will talk about one of your projects, which is about how to allocate what's the, the priority for the COVID-19 vaccine. So we very something that's applied, easy to understand how important it is and, and really looking forward discussing that. So again, really glad to have you here. And uh, as a start, I think everybody will be very interested, <laughs> and myself as well, about your background. So uh, what's led you to, to this position in Lausanne and, uh, and so on? Uh, thanks a lot for having me. I mean, you oversell the topic that I will discuss. <laughs> I will just discuss the location of uh, appointments for vaccine, but not the priority. But yeah, okay. yeah. L- let's keep it for later. Yes. Uh, background is the following. I, I, I just, I'm originally from Kyrgyzstan and I came uh, I received a scholarship to do my master studies in Berlin at some point mm-hmm. from the ARD, so this German academic, whatever, alliance, uh, which gives this uh, con- uh, scholarship in developing countries. And once uh, I was in Germany at Humboldt University in Berlin, I, I met basically during my one of the courses, my supervisor, and then I was interested in research. He actually was studying, was teaching us uh, in the advanced micro course uh, market design mm-hmm. i got interested into it and then i decided to pursue my phd once i finished phd as uh, almost everyone in economics and I, as you just did last year i went to the drug market mm-hmm. and yeah um, <laughs> destiny brought me to Lausanne, um, which is a great place to do the interaction of market design and experimental economics because you have people on both sides and you can mm-hmm. Um, fit in, in between, hopefully creating some synergies. Let's see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So far, so, so good. Yeah. So, so just for the audience, would you summarize or present what, what's market design as, as a field of research? So, so market design is, a, a, it's like you could think about it as engineers doing economics, right? So it's markets are in principle for a normal person markets, are easy. So what is market? You don't have to design any market. You just go to the shop and you pay the price. And actually, majority of markets are, are like that. It's for simple goods. Design of the market is just price, equilibrium price, demand supply. We all know that. Even kids in school nowadays know that. 
you have an equilibrium price and essentially price decides who gets what. But in some markets, it's not the case because some markets, uh, in some markets, price is not the only decisive factor or conditions are such that no one knows the price. So there are many prices. Ima imagine you, the simplest example, like, and probably the closest to what everyone knows is auction. Why do we need auction? Auction is exactly market design because sometimes if you have a, let's say, painting of Monet, which you inherited from your, you're lucky to be, to inherit from your grandmother, you, you want to sell it, you actually don't really know how much it costs. And this price discovery mechanism, one of the price discovery mechanisms is auction. And there are, I mean, auction sounds like something defined, but essentially it's not defined. There are many, many rules and many mm -hmm. different ways to run the auction. Uh, whether it's interactive format, dynamic like English auction, or it's a sealed bid auction, all of this uh, influences uh, complexity for participants. So how complicated it is for you to decide what's an optimal bid? It just, of course, affects the the payoff for the seller, which is also an important factor to turn you know uh, put into account, and uh, also determines feasibility. Some some of the auctions that we know, for instance, for multiple items, is not even for modern computers, it's not feasible to calculate. So all of these details matter and this, you could think about it as market design as a field. But in principle, there are markets more related to my research. I study markets where money are for one or another reasons and are not allowed at all. For instance, okay. if you want to locate kidneys, yeah, uh, we know that it's you know market. There are a lot of people who wants to sell their kidney and a lot of people would be happy to pay Mm -hmm. uh, for a kidney, but for some reasons, we decide that it's repugnant that we shouldn't do it. In, in Iran, it's possible. It's the only country in the world where it's legal, but in Europe, it's not. But we can still try to find the uh, designs which would allow people to to kind of increase efficiency. For instance, if I have a partner who would like to give me a kidney, but we we don't have compatibility, and someone else has a partner who would like to give her or him a kidney, but they also don't have a compatibility, but it might be the case that for instance, we are compatible to each other, we could exchange. This is an idea that we could organize a system that would run that. Mm -hmm. The same elementary school seats. How do we allocate students? Of course, everyone wants to go to the best one, especially mm -hmm. if you're talking about metropolitan areas where the quality is very heterogeneous, but something has to decide and some uh, and policymakers has to uh, have to somehow elicit preferences. Now, prices are relatively straightforward to release, but right? you can organize the auction and decide, you know, that's the price. But how do we decide what people want? How do we elicit preferences yeah. about mm -hmm. schools and universities? So broadly speaking, that's the market design. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's of course, it, it, it's meant to reach some goals. So we want to reach some goals in the markets. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, of, about fairness, about allocation, about yeah, exactly. the of, uh, of difference. You have a variety of objectives. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, but essentially efficiency, uh, some kind of degree, uh, efficiency criterion, fairness criterion, and then incentives criterion in terms of how mm -hmm. simple or complex it is for students, for participants to participate in this market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think the, the, the really the, the first usually example I take is, is one you, you took as well about kidney allocation because mm -hmm. this simple idea that was designed about, uh, is it called cycle or when you, you switch? Yeah. Trading uh, cycles, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Basically, you trade your kidney or exchange yeah. with people and you have like up to more than just a, two pairs of people exchanging, but up to, I don't know, many pairs of people exchanging, uh, creating this kind of, of cycle. And it's it really contributed to significantly increase the number of kidney transplants. And I think it, it's, it's, so it's, it's striking how, how this idea was designed in, in this field and was very beneficial and is used today, but a vast majority of people have absolutely no clue that mathematicians or economists basically <laughs> thought very hard about that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, the, there are all this, I mean, kidney exchanges are is pure, I mean, it's growing field, and then there are now they run this chain, so called. When oh, yeah. you, you, you need to have just one uh, altruistic donor to start the chain of exchanges. Of, I think the, the, the uh, record change was 81 pairs, oh, there's wow. 81 transplants. This wow. is, of course, fascinating, but 
you know, for many people, it we have to be also, you know, realistic. For many people, it's it's it can be seen as a niche, right? What is it compared to, you know, optimal inflation rate or targeted inflation and macroeconomics? I mean, uh, the, there are pluses and minuses. I, I like market design because it's very concrete and essentially many applications, for instance, educational markets and mm-hmm. the, the impact of of the design on future on on fairness in terms of chances of being accepted to the programs is huge. And um, maybe you don't save life, but you know, you create conditions for equal access to education mm-hmm. in one way or another. And then you could say, okay, maybe maybe not only inflation rate is important, <laughs> but, yeah. but also educational market. Yeah, for sure, for sure. At least I am, I'm of course convinced. Uh, in, in your website, you, it's mentioned that you're working on, on market design and matching markets is there a difference that i am missing or is... uh, so so market design is a broader field mm-hmm. right so it's it okay. could be would include auctions and matching markets is a subfield of market design as uh, this is the one which doesn't allow monetary transactions okay so okay. i think auctions is a relatively i mean i mean it's all market design is young but auctions are intensively studied from 70s let's say or maybe even 60s and theory but also in experiments because what i do i do also um, kind of behavioral market design where the idea is exactly simplicity and what you know you can create different rules and game theory would allow you to reach some solutions which you know for a game theorist or a PhD student uh, would be simple or clear but then when you put some of these mechanisms prominent mechanism you know noble price avoiding mechanism you put into practice Sometimes people don't get them and they're unhappy about them. And uh, and this is because what is true in theory is not necessarily mm, true in practice. And mm. in economics, is very, you know, you have to have a perspective because in principle, we solve for equilibrium, right? So an equilibrium is nothing we expect in the beginning. We think, okay, for many, many years or you know, people start to best respond at some point, they will reach equilibrium. And it, which is a very good assumption for many markets. But if you think about markets where people essentially participate once in their life, like college admission, or you know, you buy in a house, you know, mm-hmm. often, right? Or 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 kidney <laughs> exchange. Yeah. Uh, uh, the you know the assumption of equilibrium becomes complicated because you know you don't have much time to learn, and then the question is whether the incentives are simple enough from the beginning, or mm-hmm. maybe you can create some environment where people understand strategies better, or maybe there is some kind of intergenerational learning. And these are all behavioral things, which are kind of, okay. that's why that's why I justify the, my place in the science. So there is a place for <laughs> behavioral investigation. I see, very there. interesting. And then I guess your part, you, you're also into experimental because then you want to test all those behavior in the lab. Exactly. So you basically, so what is good, we, we assign people incentives in the lab through, mo- through money and then we know their optimal strategies and then we change something in treatments and we understand whether it, for instance, improved optimality or not. And then we kind of try to find this something uh, outside, you know, or something scalable or something externally valid in terms of what makes yeah. people understand or not understand things. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's something. So, so if you are into economics, you, you kind of know that. But for, for other people, that might be a bit uh, also not f- necessarily clear. When we say in the lab in that case, and correct me if it's not in your case, usually we say uh, it's a room with computers where students mostly <laughs> will play games or play games. So, so it might be viewed negatively, but, but it's just they will interact through computer programs and we will or the researcher will observe their their behavior and their answer to incentive to different situation that replicates situation a wide variety of situation that that could arise in reality and, and that's what we we kind of suggest by in the lab is, is yeah, correct that, is that's it? essentially true I, th- I think what is important to understand for for if you are not familiar with experimental economics so mm-hmm. lab is exactly you know place with computers where anonymity is mm-hmm. essentially insured but what is important we pay real money 
we create an incentive to create an individual. Imagine you are an individual and I, and I have data, right? Now there is tons of data. Why would I ever go to the lab where there is a data which I can even buy? And I know what you, let's say we talk about your choices of schools. So I know which schools you, cho- you submitted, you know, you submitted school A as a top choice, school B as a second choice and so on. But I, I will never be able to know, or at least, the right kind of metric techniques which people kind of use using use equilibrium logic. But I, essentially, I, convincingly, I, I'm not able to know whether you, is it your true preferences or is it a strat- strategic yeah. response? But in lab, I tell you, I pay you 25 francs if you go to school A and I pay you 10 francs if you go to, go to school B. So if you rank school B higher than A, I know that you, you do it for out of strategic reasons because we still assume that people like money. And I think in the case of <laughs> students, it's true. <laughs> and in the case of those who come to the lab to, you know, to spend one hour and earn something like 20 francs, it's a good idea, you know. Mm-hmm. We hope they still maximize money mm-hmm. with a utility. I mean, sometimes we run uh, uh, experiments which are exactly not about maximizing money, but maximizing utility, like measuring social preferences, whether mm-hmm. you want to donate to that charity or that charity mm-hmm. and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, in market design, we are not uh, that advanced. We don't take uh, charities yet into account and try to just basically test fundamental concepts of game, game theory, understanding mm-hmm. of dominant strategy, equilibrium, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I just thought about that again because I, I, I really remember that at the time I was, uh, when Bettina Klaus, one of your colleagues uh, mm-hmm. uh, in Lausanne, in, in the field was teaching uh, was teaching me in, in Lausanne, I really wanted also uh, and thought a lot about going in this field. And, and for you, what, what led you actually to, to, to pick? Was uh, it this so class you had or is it something <laughs> else? Yeah, it's always a good question. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I was writing master thesis about it. I mean, I think knowledge and exposure. I mean, I, I could be honest. And I, I mean, I could have created the story that, you know, I always have been motivated <laughs> by societal impact. It's not true, right? I mean, sometimes, you know, uh, you. so I was exposed to this research a lot in terms of having seminars. It's, it's super interesting for me, but you, I wouldn't say that, it, you know, it's, I, I think it's the most important thing in the world, but I think it's something where I can contribute. I think it's important. And it seems like my, um, you know, skill set uh, is is fine, fits into it. But uh, maybe maybe if were I exposed to something else at the time, I, I might have chosen differently. You know, there there is some kind of past dependence. So I was lucky to have this class by my supervisor. Yeah. I felt it's important and interesting. I was also fascinated um, uh, through applicability in a sense. Mm-hmm. I think as a crack, as a master student at the time you do have a little bit of crisis of trying to match uh, uh, the, the whole integrals and math that you do and then all these matrices and econometrics and, uh, and you match it to, to the impact. And I think this was a good, I mean, that was easy to, to imagine to be useful. And, and of course, everything is useful, but this was easiest to imagine to be useful. <laughs> No, I really like your answer, and I think that's very that's very true and shared by certainly many in academia. You end up in very specific fields that you didn't know existed, like as a teenager. So it's difficult to say, "Wait, I always dreamed about being exactly in this very specific field." And I think it's it's uh, it's very important, and it shows and reveals. Maybe it's, it's a bit outside the, the topic, but but how important it is to expose people to, to knowledge, exactly as you said, and the possibility. And then indeed you, you, you end up, it's the same. I had a video where I was saying that I was fascinated by statistics, but it's the same. I was exposed to it. And as you learn, it's also combined to, with something you like it, you're not bad at it. And, and it reinforces uh, the, 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 the behavior going in that direction, basically. So, so I think it's also very uh, important to show it, present it in that way. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I'm always envy to people who, you know, as they knew their topic <laughs> from the beginning, and they knew their profession from the beginning. I'm yeah. not the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it, actually, it's, it's funny because it's exactly a discussion at the beginning of my PhD I had with my wife many times because she was always asking, but why is he doing this topic or researching this thing or, or doing that? And, and most of the time I had no answer. 
not even for myself or when asking to the people and most of the people will say well it was a bit random <laughs> I, I was approached by a professor i saw this topic i was interested and then you you basically tick take one part and you get carried on there and and then you might end up fascinated by what you're doing but it's not obvious to start with i think that yeah and what is what you said is very important so what is important for sure is at some point to get fascinated with what you're doing and having a bigger picture and you know i i do other stuff too and i i, I mean in, as an early career researcher it's maybe not the best idea to do everything you know which come to mind because it's and even i mean it took me a couple I, i'm not a good example probably but i mean for me honestly it took like i don't know uh, two three papers or so several years to understand what is actually the most important in this field and i started uh, at least what i believe now probably yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in five years i will <laughs> think that i will uh, uh, i know something else which is the most important uh, but that's important it's important that in the end you if you if you randomly thrown in the wrong direction i think it's also important to realize that it's not yours early on and not necessarily follow and um, if this happens i know i know phd students from my cohort who totally switched their field on the third year and then just because i mean they finished the project they made the publishable paper but they changed the field and they are much happier in new fields and then they, they're super successful uh, so it's also i think not it's if you if your randomness brought you to something you don't like it's not also a good idea to, to continue. Mm -hmm. You have to believe what you do, mm -hmm. let's say. Yeah. yeah, and follow maybe the, the small ins. For example, you have something that's attractive or that you have pleasure and you kind of navigate following those those hints again but yeah, yeah so, so something like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and we have many students so so re watching us so hopefully it, it, it will yeah, hopefully there. someone will uh, <laughs> or, uh, will get inspired okay, or, or will nice. understand that his uh, or her way is justified yeah so now it it, it will be very interesting to really talk about your research. So you have this, this paper about uh, COVID vaccination, if I'm not mistaken, but would you like also uh, to, to present broadly your, your research or, or we can jump on that one now? I, I mean, we can jump uh, jump on that one. So I, I don't have a paper on COVID. Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's a bummer, uh, but sorry. I have a piece, I have a policy piece which is recent about uh, that, but right. which is based on a paper which is now first come in an American Economic Review, uh, which is, uh, you know, a great success for me at least i perceive it so and the paper is about i think it's it's very unusual application of market design essentially it finds a new application of market design and um and it's kind of my understanding I mean, we've been working on this paper for four years so that's how sometimes even five i think now, yeah. uh that how long it takes and it's not that it was too complicated so it's just that the field was developing and our perception of applications was developing and everything started with the and i will bridge it to COVID 19 vaccine but i think it's more important to understand the core of the paper the, the original paper we started with observation actually someone from foreign ministry of germany approached us because in 2015 because in 2014 there was a syrian crisis happened and uh, um, Merkel at the time essentially announced that she would be happy to accept everyone who has relatives in Germany first. And uh, uh, people mm -hmm. start to, and, and this created huge over demand for the slots in the German embassy. So to, in order to get an in, a visa uh, in Germany, essentially in almost most of the countries where you need a visa, you would have to schedule an interview, which guarantees you nothing, right? You just Go, uh, you know, you just go and uh, file you uh, your documents. So, but you have to come. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, and this is a hit. So, the, the, for a long time, uh, the all these processes were scheduling kind of uh, in person. Right? This, you know, people would come to the embassy. I, I went through it. I remember the first time I went to Europe from Kyrgyzstan before my studies. We would go to German embassy. And then we would, uh, there would be some list and we would try to find an appointment and then we would come back uh, on, on this particular day. But of course, uh, digitalization comes in and uh, many services like that, which are offered the scheduled appointments now move online. Mm -hmm. and, and the first 
kind of logical thing to use is first come first set system. You just mm -hmm. log in, you say, okay, I want an appointment. You look for appointment and you say it's mine, right? So this, this is a free appointment. And this is a great system. It looks like, right? I mean, it provides a service for society. You don't have to go there. You don't have to queue. But mm -hmm. what, what happened when there is over demand, and this was one of the first cases of that, is that scalpers, so black market develops for that. So the, what, we, what, what we started with is this uh, uh, person from uh, for, Foreign Ministry of Germany who said we, there was a newspaper, a media coverage of the fact oh. that a lot of people cannot get these appointments, but on the black market, you can buy them for five, $500. Wow. Which is a huge amount of money for Syria, especially people in a complicated situation. At the same time, German embassy faced a lot of no shows. So people oh, yeah, schedule yeah. appointments, but no one yeah. comes. Yeah. But no one can come. And this, wow. and this thing exploded. And the prob problematic part of it is that what people start to think about is that they think it's something connected with corruption. Maybe someone inside German embassy is selling that. Or, and then, they, of course, uh, it's uh, absolutely unacceptable for, <laughs> for German embassy to have this image. So they, start, yes. they put all these disclaimers and then they start to change the system. And they change the system in an ad hoc way, in a way that they think is good, right? So they start mm -hmm. to put a lot of CAPTCHA verifications, control of uh, additional control of IDs, phonings, but okay. nothing helps. You know, seven years passed, this, if you Google getting visa interview in India nowadays or in Shanghai or in Bishkek where I'm from, it's mm -hmm. essentially impossible. There are no slots in the foreseeable future, especially for a period, I mean, now COVID, so there are no slots for different reasons, but, yes. uh, but in principle, in the peak hours, mm -hmm. there are no slots. Mm -hmm. And the same and, and the similar thing happened, you know, while writing the papers, it happened everywhere. In Ireland, they even changed the law that people, they used to be that those who uh, migrants were permanently li living in Ireland would have to have a uh, interview, you know, kind of registration of, of leaving the country. And they never could get the slots, a lot of uh, queues overnight oh, wow. in Dublin. So they canceled that, but still to even prolong your residence permit, you, you have to queue overnight. Uh, prefectures in France, the same. Um, driving licenses, uh, appointments in California. When, when airlines stopped accepting driving licenses uh, to fly within US, mm -hmm. it created a shock of demand for changing driving license. So these appointments are also sold by, by legit um, startup, which you know have been sued by, or promised to be sued by many governments, but there's nothing to be sued. They don't do anything illegal, they sell services. And, but people don't like the services because it's, this is the services of scalpers. So what happens that all these verifications that people try to impose, they have nothing, they will never help. Because this is a fundamental feature of this, uh, you know, battle for the speed. It's a uh, first come first curve system makes it so that person who has a bot, basically computer program, will always win the human. Uh, yes. And what these firms mm -hmm. do, they essentially, uh, they essentially take any available slot and mm -hmm. book it on a fake name. So mm -hmm. verification of fake names doesn't help much because I can, let's say, I don't need a slot, but the firm knows. Or let's say I'm a sculptor and I have, a, yep. and and I want to sell the slots. I'm not interested in a slot, so I I I have an array of I don't know 150 names. It can be real or fake names because it, there is no automatic verification at this moment. And uh, what I do, I book all the available slots through the bot. Whenever mm -hmm. at the second they become available. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you want to go to Germany from India, let's say, for studies. And then you come to the German embassy and you see no slots. You see no slot today, tomorrow. You come every morning. You know that they are, can become available at 7 a.m. and there are no slots. And at some point you see the ads in some kind of fishy oh, yeah. uh, Facebook marketplace, which offer you a slot for 50. And it was me. And what, you, what happens when you come to me and you pay me 50 bucks, I cancel one slot. Let's say the one is on my name. 
because it's first time system it wow. appears okay, in the you system have, yeah, exactly, okay. and in, in in the same moment my bot is the fastest again and i essentially transfer full identity okay and this is a business model which um which runs in many countries and uh wow. and in principle one could say from economic perspective it's okay because you know people who <laughs> have higher willingness to pay can pay and you know there are a lot of economists who would say or oh, it's it's not a problem of the market. It's just a stupid people who want to give a give away something which is valuable for free. But the reality is that it's also important to have equal access. And for instance, by law, a lot of of these applications cannot just take any money for the services. And essentially, it's not very different from uh, you know even even Apple. So Apple Genius Bar appointments in Shanghai and Beijing, you can buy for 15, 20 bucks and. Or you never get them. Wow. Okay. So, and, you know, medical medical appointments in China, yeah. which you actually have to pay the same. So things exploded. To, I mean, we started with a small application and then the thing exploded and we understood that essentially we solved mm -hmm. this issue for all of this application. And our solution is very simple intuitively. So what you should do, so the, the whole cause of the problem is a speed. So there, is, yep. there are two important moments. There is ID verification at the moment of consumption. So when you go to the German embassy and if you had appointment on my name, but you yep. come, it will not go. Yep. So this is important. So you do need to have correct credential to consume the appointment. And the second, is, and this is important, and, but speed eliminates any effort or any power of it essentially. Mm -hmm. Uh, second thing, what is important is that you cannot have two two appointment uh, two applications on your name inside of the system at the same time. This is true because it's verified. So it's to verify. So what we do is the following. So you discretize the time. So instead of having you know first come first serve system, we call it batch system. It's very similar to this famous paper about uh, high frequency trading. Then. Uh, uh, look at it. It's a good paper. <laughs> Eric Budish, Crampton, and Shia. Uh, we will put it uh, in the description. I'll, I'll ask you again the, the, the <laughs> yeah. reference. So it's a great paper about uh, how this uh, essentially how high frequency ter uh, terms use arbitrage and uh, by just competing on speed because they invest in the high uh, fastest yeah. internet. And But yeah. here is also, the problem is that bots are faster than, than, than people and, and, and it's not a good idea. So what we should do is you, you discretize time intervals. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking, so you go to website and instead of choosing an appointment, you just uh, signal your preferences of appointments. You apply for appointments, say, I want an appointment. Essentially, the reality now is such that no one chooses appointment. Everyone takes any available appointment. But in reality, we could do, you know, you could submit preference list. I would prefer appointment in the morning of appointment mm -hmm. today and so on. And then people just submit this during, let's say, day, one day. And then indeed, in 7 p.m., uh, all the available appointments are allocated. And if there is over demand, then lottery decides who, get, okay. who gets it. So the, and those bots cannot like feel uh, like because if it's randomly allocated, let's say uh, the tomorrow you have the, the bots with different identities, they manage to get different identities, a hundreds, and they just mm -hmm. flood the yeah. thing to so, have a higher. No, it's a very important question, of course. So, so what's um, uh, so this is a whole change of a system, right? So, this is how system works. So, why is it solving the problem? It's solving the problem completely, we show theoretically in the experiment. But the intuition why is that, of, is that speed advantage is gone. Of course, Scalpa still can generate thousand identities yeah. and essentially take all slots. Right? Yeah. Imagine I generated million identities. Yeah. So the fact that you submitted your application doesn't help much because you will not get it. I will get it on some names. Yeah. But now I cannot tell them. When you come to me to buy, I would have to cancel it. Yeah. And if I cancel it, it will be located in the next batch. And then you applying directly for the next batch has exactly the same chance to get on your name than That's me. Very cool. And <laughs> uh, essentially, it's a main equilibrium. Uh, but there is there are other equilibrium when the cost of participation is very cheap, then I can kind of sell the threat of being there. So if it's costless for me to be in the market and destroy the market, then I can say, 
buy from me as a wise ago flat million but in 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 under realistic parameters of end costs it's it's not feasible so the scalper will always suffer losses and and what we do in this paper we show theoretically uh, we we of course discuss many details how it has to be implemented and what uh, what is important how long this guy should be and the paper is very easy i mean their mass is very small it's really practically you know uh, describes how you would do it and then we discuss also other markets where it could work and for of course there are many markets where scalpers are like that you know if you want to go to uh, you know at Sheeran's ticket uh, concept it's also going to be underpriced because at Sheeran doesn't want to sell on at market price because it's probably going to be not many you know it will destroy his fan base or champions <laughs> league final yeah. you don't want to have the richest one there because you know then people will just drink champagne and, and hardly clap <laughs> on the goals and you have to sell transmission right there are yeah. all of these concerns in markets and uh, essentially everywhere it would work if you have if you can impose a verification but easy sneakers there you cannot right this batch system wouldn't work but exactly for the strategy you said right because a scalper yeah. can flat with applications and then who can uh forbid uh, scalper just to resell the sneakers right but uh, but in terms of concepts and spot events you know the, the, there is a long discussion that they want to introduce the verification of tickets but and it's it's costly in a sense. First, people said it's costly because you know you have to do it. So many people. It's not true. I, I personally went to World Champion World Cup last year. It was the one which was in Russia, and mm -hmm. and I went on a ticket which I didn't buy through lottery. So it was on a, a totally random name, and I had to scan my name as a passport and this name. So system knew that the mismatch, yeah. but they didn't cancel. Didn't they still allowed me because otherwise it would have to. Have this logistical problems on entrance and uh, also stadium would be half empty yeah. which is not the best for world cup yeah. so the, this conflict of incentives is a bit there but if in principle if if uh, someone could credibly impose the threat of verification then it would also work for the sporting events but mm -hmm. yeah the, the conflict of incentives but for our case it works and now coming to vaccine yeah. You know, and uh, th this is a very similar. So the, the small, I mean, I'm not going to discuss who has to be prioritized. It's a country's decision. And, uh, and okay. uh, but but how to allocate the slots for vaccines? It's going to be so. I mean, one thing I is which is important in many many cases, first come first serve system would work perfectly. And this many many cases is absence of huge over demand. So mm -hmm. I'm quite sure the first price, the first price, first serve system in Switzerland would work okay, but in megapolises it might create black market for vaccine appointments exactly for the same logic because now, but there is a lot of problems now already with vaccine uh, with scheduling appointments because uh, another cost of first come first serve system is this lost attempts. You wake up in the morning yeah. and you rush. You want to try to be first and you fail and you do it every day and you yeah. spend hours and hours in doing so for no reason because in the batch system, you would just not do it. You would just apply. You can apply for automatic reapplication and every okay. day at 7 p.m. Uh, learn. Exactly, yeah. Uh, whether you do it or not. So uh, we wrote this piece about vaccination because, of, because we expect. So now in Germany and in France and in Switzerland, currently only people... Uh, you know, all elders and 75, 80 are vaccinated. And then typically the vacations, uh, so the scheduling is happening over the phone. Mm -hmm. But already there, in, in Canada, there are these articles where people say that it's impossible to get because, they, mm -hmm. you know, they get one million calls within, you know, one or two hours and wow. people spending so long on this queues. And it, of course, it's great also on fairness, I expect, because someone who has grandchildren to act on their behalf they probably more likely to get a uh, vaccination faster than those who don't. Maybe that's not even that big because the market is not that big. And in principle, these letters which send you the spin code, they regulate the demand which comes. But at some point, when it comes to general population, uh, uh, policymakers will face trade off. From one side, they can send many letters because when you have many letters, you know that they're going to be over demand. And once there is over demand, the waste of vaccine is very unlikely. Mm -hmm. But once you create over demand and use first come first serve system, this could be the bottleneck of the yes. system. Mm -hmm. And there are some 
suggesting articles from New York, for instance, where it, is, it seems to be some signs of like market for the vaccination slot there. There are no, mm. I haven't seen, I mean, uh, proof or something. It's all about, you know, uh, um, and, and it's not new novel uh, academically. That's why we write the policy piece about it. But it seems like the small market design choice of how to do that can, mm -hmm. can save you a lot of troubles and also a lot of public, you know, happiness or unhappiness. Because if I would have to uh, every day log in and try to hunt this vaccination slots, it's not the, the most amazing experience. No one, uh, why would you spend? So it's also heavy in terms of technology, in terms of how much uh, your server uh, is you yes. know, uh, robust to many demands at the same second and so on. And yeah. there are this uh, evidence that they fail kind of. But yeah, the, the piece is about that. So it's also <laughs> not, not that much on vaccine, but about the fact that you need to schedule them, not on first come first off basis, because otherwise black market can appear in countries where there is over demand. Mm -hmm. And um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hustle with booking mm -hmm. can, mm -hmm. can create uh, the damage. So, so how did you... Necessary. Yeah. So how did you 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 wrote kind of this policy piece? It's a two page, three page document. Yeah, there. yeah, it's uh, two or three pages. So we we posted in two places. So one it it was in Berlin, and then there is a French version. Um, actually, my uh, the, my co-author wrote uh, wrote it. I, I, don't, I don't know where they published it. I think I can I can look for it. But the, it's it, essentially it's three for uh, three pages piece. It's just text. It's new like newspaper article. I can give you a link. It's, uh, and you actively it's also contacted uh, decision makers. What is uh, no. <laughs> no, to... no. <laughs> I have to tell you immediately no. <laughs> but you know it's hard. First of all, many policymakers perceive it as not important um, for many reasons. Because of, currently, of course, getting vaccines is more important. Defi defining priorities is probably more important. And this seems to be like a small thing, which is not important. And you would need to have a perspective and understanding. Uh, and you would have to ex anticipate like market for something, which I think is not very natural to anticipate. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think uh, we didn't. We, don't, we wouldn't even know whom to contact, and we didn't contact anyone. But we we, we published this piece just two days ago, and and we hope that you know some some media might uh, catch his attention. But um, mm -hmm. in the end, we are just not that good. Um, yeah, everyone has different uh, <laughs> competitive advantage. We are good in doing research, and probably not that good in putting it into practice. <laughs> so, so maybe some other people are better. But in our Japanese course, who is in Japan, he actually is in direct contact with the ministry, and they might. Um, so mm -hmm. he he is the closest to them. Mm -hmm. um, I I personally didn't contact anyone for good mm -hmm. or for bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so hopefully exactly. I I think it, it's. It's interesting because it's definitely not something that's done often, right? The connection between policymakers, between academics, and but already you you, you made a, a big step, meaning you you did this policy piece. You speak in the language uh, that's accessible okay. to everyone in a concise exactly. way, a few pages. It's accessi accessible. So I guess also potentially the the driving force here is either you you have a, a way to contact. No audience, but or a large set of people, or it's also the the, the journalist, the press that will catch up on your policy piece and then relay the information, which is, I guess, also one one way that it ends up in the in the hands of the decision makers. Yes, that's actually the the hope that journalists might do this job. Uh, I don't know how. Um, you know, and it's hard to know what is popular and what is not. I, 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 so sometimes very hot topics and not necessarily fundamental yeah. get hot and sometimes very fundamental gets hot. Yeah. And my, I, my personal perception is that uh, maybe, yeah, uh, I'm not very, uh, I mean, I'm foreign now and I don't think that Switzerland will suffer a lot because it's not, you know, overly populated society with not, not many, <laughs> you know, um, uh, cities with a uh, huge density. But uh, I think in Japan, it's going to be a problem. That's why Japanese uh, professor moves forward, Japanese course. And in Germany, we do try that through media and uh, kind of trying the institutional, institutional infrastructure to kind of reach policymakers. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Am I optimistic about that? Not, not really, but it's worth trying. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and I think it would be, so I, I, would, I would say that if, if the problem would be there, it would be easier to solve. I think we know from more fundamental problems, like if you look at the, because market design is a field where you read a lot of stories of how you know, Nobel laureates interacted with policymakers in different cities, how they changed mm -hmm. school choice system, how they changed the kidney exchange system. Yeah. And this is not, it, it was never easy on much more on the, on the problem which policymakers already faced. The you know, problem with, then economists come and you should understand them, uh, explain them this never, it's, you know, um, my, my true belief is that either problem is so dramatic that they really look for the help and then you come, or, uh, and this is just my opinion, I think, uh, or you really have to be lucky that some of the policymakers intrinsically interested, you know, yep. they're, is, they're just driven. Um, yep. This is how you run field, this is how I run field experiments. You just find someone who is the, you know, has power and has, uh, you know, runs the firm and just intrinsically motivated mm -hmm. and interested in, in, in the pitch you gave and in research. And mm -hmm. then you do it very easily. And then <laughs> sometimes yeah. and so you, are, you ask some thousands of others and they just don't. And um, mm -hmm. this is how it is. I think it's, it's fair, I think, yeah. kind of. It made me think about when I visited the, the EU uh, in, in Brussels, I think the parliament, mm -hmm. uh, um, was, I'm not sure which building was it, but they, they had a whole part uh, just dedicated at the exchange between uh, politicians and lobbyists. We, we should invite academics as well to discuss to, <laughs> or, or people representing, you know, academia, like what, what are the big problems you face? Well, we might have a cool solution or cool is not the right word, but uh, a very important uh, solution to something because that, that's really something that's striking sometimes. It, it's very hard. And I, I think I, I really see this willingness to go forward, but I guess it's, a, it's still a long road to connect worlds that are very different with different language incentives, working in different places, different deadlines. I mean, as you said, you, you had your papers over five yeah. years and that's quite, that, that might- A lot. Yeah. No, but it's not but my only normal. paper. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes, no. But, but, yeah, <laughs> but that's how it works. It's, uh, yeah. I, I totally agree with you. The language is different, but also sets of skills. You know, we, we um, even, I mean, you are econometrician, right? So you, you go into causality and how long you, find causality of some exogenous variation in some paper. And then imagine you would uh, need to do this for every uh, antitrust case. They, they, they would just, you know, no one would wait for the yeah. pro proper evidence. That's yes. why there are consultants who do this, you know, semi-correlational kind of semi convincing work. And sometimes yeah. they are even right because yeah. they take the risk and they, their incentives are that. And our yeah. incentives are that. I think this, I mean, I do think that the problem is not only by far not only policymakers, but also we we talk we have different incentives and in, so from the kind of fundamental con solution to the practical solution, it's a very long way. You have to find a programmer who would do that because this system is bought. German, um, you know, foreign ministry just bought the system for first come first start, probably not for one million, right? Yeah. And uh, and probably they didn't put in a budget the change of the system in a year or two, <laughs> just because it's somehow a semi convincing and it works in uh, 99, 90 yeah. percent of places perfectly. So yeah. now these guys come, someone has to write it. They don't have own programmers. It's it's become complicated. It becomes complicated. There are some nuances, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, I mean, I couldn't uh, uh, start, you know, start doing research and, and devote a year on consulting on particular one application. Maybe I should, but may, I mean, I'm on a tenure track, and <laughs> and I have to produce research, and maybe I should do something else. So the truth is somewhere in between, and I think that there there are, there are places. So I think the the more senior you get in academia, and if you do this kind of research, I think the more important it gets to you, and it also makes sense. If you get mm -hmm. on a tenured professor position, you want probably probably some societal impact or some putting something of your research or expertise mm -hmm. into practice bring you a bit more value than an additional publication. 
mm-hmm. while I don't know what is your perception of it, but in our case, the junior researchers, I think it's, it's really the other way around. Uh, also in terms of incentives, in terms of how we are perceived on the market, uh, whether we get tenure and so on. It doesn't say that it stops me from doing it. I wouldn't even know whether I can do it now, but I, it's not even, but it definitely uh, creates me a comfort that I shouldn't necessarily you know, spend my days and nights looking for a policymaker mm-hmm. to put it into practice. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's, <laughs> that's how I read it. No, but that, that's true. And, and I think, but again, the, maybe the incentives are slowly changing in the sense I, I, I was discussing with a, with a friend who's now in Harvard. Um, and he told me also that in the process of hiring a young academics, now they really ask more and more actually um, contribution to society and it could be through social media it could be through policy pieces and, and those things get more and more weights in the, and i think that's that's very promising because indeed it's, it's our job in the end as researchers is doing research of course that, that's the whole point of the thing but but as you said maybe there is a, at the beginning of your career you really focus on that because you have to to prove yourself uh, your, your value in that field and then maybe you have more time and and more incentive to to broaden the 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 public or the the, the, where you want to share your results and i think that's also one of the if i'm not mistaking one of the key things that e4s they they really enterprise for society they really want to to do applied research with maybe shorter papers shorter time frame that in such a way that they can apply it directly they face a challenge this year and maybe at the end of the year they have a proper answer to something that's really arising now so, so I think it's complementary. Uh, definitely, you need also the sometimes the hundred-page paper with two hundred robustness check to answer properly. Yeah, this is you guys. Uh, <laughs> in experimental yeah. economics, we don't have. This. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> That's, no, yeah, but I'm this... always impressed by uh, by this empirical work with two hundred robustness checks. This, um, yeah. No, but, but we this don't have it to, uh, yet. Thank yeah. God. It's not coming to an end. Definitely not, and I'm very junior, so I don't want to do to give broad <laughs> conclusion. But it seems that it's just not productive for anyone. For nobody will read it in the end, and the 200 re- revision with 500 robustness check at the end, you you get lost. Uh, yeah. But in terms of editors, I think I mean, I uh, so we had an editor. So this paper was shortened from. I think 45 to 25 pages in the final version, just because the editor said so. And that's the policy. And I think all the top journals are you know, pushing for this practice a lot mm-hmm. because it's true that uh, my, most of the, I mean, we, we, we have an appendix, right? <laughs> so, 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 so if you want to go into proofs, you would have to go to appendix. But yeah. in terms of the communicating message, for this particular paper, 25 is enough. Probably 25 is by far not enough for many other papers, especially those who would have, you know, uh, regression tables of three, two yep. pages. But um, but in principle, we, I, I also hope that sometimes you, you read a paper as a book, and which is great because you think, wow, I mean, these guys, they did like, I mean, um, I, my fantasy would never be uh, so fruitful to understand that you should control for that which is great because it's a high quality work, but in a sense, probably the main message is still, uh, you know, formulated in abstract. And then you, within 20, 20, 30 pages, you can, you can convince me that this is the case. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's see, we are, yeah, yeah. so far we are following the norms, I, I think, but hopefully at some point we can change yes. the norms. Yes, yeah, we'll <laughs> see. Uh, something else that's if we come back to COVID and market design, actually, I was wondering maybe that you have no answer, and that's not a problem. Uh, if there is research as well uh, about the priority, because now you see yeah. that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for example, in, uh, in priority, uh, how to allocate or priority in emergency room, it's also kind of things that have been studied in market design, like who is first, yeah? Yeah, so there is a, there is a paper from by very famous people, by uh, I think uh, von Sernmes, by Barak Patak, maybe by Utku Unver. Um, it's about, I mean, it's not so the, this is very important so none of so what people think about what is the research about priority is some kind of normative claims look we have to give the priority to elderly one 
So this you will never find in market design paper because it's uh, not market design thing. What market design does is that there is some kind of goal. For instance, you want to implement particular distribution or goal of fairness and, and you need tools to implement it. And this actually sounds like a simple thing, but it's not because often policymakers screw up. Like for instance, you know, you create reserves this is a very common mistake. You know, you want to create reserves for some, mm-hmm. for some minority. Mm-hmm. And this actually can lead to the fact that uh, minorities are hurt very easily, depending on whether you process reserve first or uh, general population first. Maybe they, don't, they are not hurt, but they definitely don't get any advantage from these reserves. So the so paper about how to implement priority groups in which order, this is a paper about market design which group should be vaccinated first i would say it's probably philosophy at least i didn't know i don't know the paper on market design. it's, it's a bit okay. normative okay yeah. there are papers cool. who argue distribution wise so you can have a model kind of from one side this guy spread more like young yeah. ones and that one yeah. So this is not market design paper, but there are papers, empirical papers like that. I don't know. I see, what some I see, the, the, um, I see where it's, it becomes philosophical. Because I, I was thinking about the problem and I, I've read, I think, I'm not sure if it's now um, where I've seen this paper or this uh, notes report or something. It was about the fact that actually um, priority was was costly. I think it was NBR working paper, but I'm not sure. Basically, the, the idea of the, the the paper was giving priority makes the whole system slower because you could use different allocation. It's more complicated or. Sp- I'm not exactly sure why, but that was one of the, the assumptions. And then basically, as it's slower overall, you take more time to vaccinate everyone. So in the end, is it, are you saving more lives? So let's say we put a, a clear metric. Mm-hmm. Let's say the, the optimal is one life is one life. It could be an mm-hmm. old person. And like this, we, we don't enter this realm. Mm-hmm. That might be a bit more tricky. But one life is one life. The objective is to minimize the number of deaths. And you have a model of uh, uh, how the disease will spread. And you see how to allocate in such a way that you minimize the number of deaths. And then it could be that basically you allocate to anybody or what? what? Yeah, so this, this is a typical, you know, modeling exercise. It's a, I, I don't think it's very, I mean, so there is this one market design paper by like, essentially every star uh, semi-related to, to market design uh, US has. It's a very complicated paper on how to allocate incentives. So it's with 20 authors among them, you know, for instance, using an So, so how to create incentives such, so how do you locate governmental funds across different producers of drugs? So how to kind of uh, facilitate production of vaccine in terms of allocation of money. But this is not what you say. What you say is re- typical modeling papers. I actually don't know the one you said, because essentially there, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think it's a very intro- interesting exercise. It, if you have, uh, if you get the, the probabilities right, which is always the biggest question. <laughs> and you were the one who, who fascinated by statistics knows how much. So the key is whether you believe these probabilities or not. And then, you know, uh, simulations is, a, is the outcome of it. So as like, you know, there are the simulation who said that uh, uh, lockdown saved, uh, I don't know, 30 million lives. Someone said 2 million lives. Someone said it saved nothing. Yeah. Depends on your assumption. So in a sense, it's really not market design, but uh, it's a good... I mean, but this is very applied, good question. So even imagine you're a policymaker who actually believes the numbers you have, then it's, of course, a good question to understand uh, whom to vaccinate first. Yeah. But again, I think even in this hardcore model, you, your political interest comes in, not political, like perceptions come in. I think it's probably very controversial to say let's, let's uh, first vaccinate this misbehaving students because they drink all the time and spread this because then uh, probably not many voters would, would understand, uh, would support you because they cannot visit their grandmothers who are, you know, isolated and yeah. dying from loneliness yes. because uh, they're tired. So, no, I think, I don't, and I can 
perfectly see where behavior yeah. comes in yeah. because yeah. here exactly because here you can say you you should adapt so if you have the standard sir model which i think it's it's in the case of this paper you don't take into account human behavior and here it's very important because let's say as soon as you say this is the priority group and this group are the young <laughs> people they will go out and, and party like crazy one more i i don't know but that might be a consequence and hence it's changed everything so what's now is the optimal things to do because they behave differently is it still this group or should you prevent them to act like this so so it's indeed it becomes very complicated and i perfectly agree with you that sometimes we, we should accept the limitation of modeling it becomes mm. just too complicated and and i think with covid it's the, a good example we have so many different things going no, on no. and estimates and i think even i mean, I mean um, modeling are definitely limited it's true but i think the complexity comes from unknown assumptions and i think in some places modeling are almost perfect right so where we so if you don't know, we don't know so much about this. I mean, now we're supposed to know much, but I think we still don't know a lot about COVID. And, and I think the virologist and uh, they, I think a lot of policy decisions are taken on, taken based on models, but I think it's naive to believe that the model which spit, uh, spit out this minimal life, um, you know, suffered from COVID or a minimal number of deaths is the one chosen by policy makers. I don't believe so. First of all, because we don't even know whether it's objective. And second of all, and I'm not judging it, I'm just, don't know, no one told us uh, that, uh, but also because there is a trade, economic trade-off, small, but uh, I guess it's there, but also there are trade-offs of, you know, public. So what is very behavioral is public perceptions. What, what is perceived to be good, what is found approvals, and this I think it's really like hard to model economically. And mm -hmm. and I and, and there are a lot of I think in Zurich. I mean, you are you have the courses in Sandro, Sandro Ambel. He he has a paper with Axel Confels. I mean, loosely related, but we 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 only start to it's related to market design because it's connected through repugnance. We should only start to understand which markets are repugnant. Why is that? We want to forbid transactions we are not involved in, right? I mean, it's crazy, right? These guys want to exchange kidneys. Why is it, why I am here voting against that? Mm -hmm. So this market of why is it, why repugnance is there? We just start to understand and the experiments and surveys are a very important tool for that. But also we just start to understand what is paternalism and what is, how do we project this paternalism? And why do I think that someone, I mean, the reveal preferences do not work lately, right? I mean, if uh, I, you 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 allow grandmothers to go on the market, they're all they're all on the market. There is a risk zone, and they all chatting uh, close to the you know fruit yeah. section. And then you think, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, where, where, where is the limit where the, where governments can dictate us? What is the limit of freedom? What to which extent yes. we have to be protected? This is super empirical, important questions. It's yeah. actually booming modern philosophy, as I heard, mm. and um, mm -hmm. and I think we will need a lot of answers about that. Also, yeah. with you know self-driving cars, developing exactly, yeah. and, and and all this stuff. So yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's so I think true. Uh, these are fascinating questions, and they're not very scientific. One could say it's really so, but we still need uh, scientific ways to elicit preferences correctly, understand their determinants, and try to understand uh, maybe the optimal kind of design and optimal policy which mm -hmm. would fit these preferences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh that's true that's a, that's a, one last thing so that was a very good <laughs> already <laughs> near, near conclusion but one, one last thing that made me think about market design when we are going to think about the vaccine was also a, a news that I, I've, I've seen that was about the fact that basically most uh, basically rich countries uh, took all the, the vaccine, managed to mm -hmm. pay in some way, or basically the, the mass of vaccine ended up in, in uh, rich countries. And, and do, do you have any clue or, or something to say about what might have hap happened? Because in the end, it made me think about something you said in the beginning. Maybe if you can pay the price higher here, it's also not ethical. It's, it should be allocated between countries as well, differently. Yeah. 
it's a very complicated topic because in a sense, I mean, the, 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 we, we can go step first. I mean, it, it's not that vaccine is given. It's, it's costly to produce and someone has to compensate for it. And otherwise, I mean, if, if it wouldn't be the case and probably we wouldn't have a vaccine. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So, but I, I do think, I mean, we have World Health Organization and you can be more skeptical or, or more enthusiastic about it. And, and it does provide a lot of, later transfers to the developing countries but in but if you look at the puzzle i mean I'm, i i i went to kyrgyzstan in december there are mm-hmm. no there are no restrictions there are no there is no covid life is as there was a, a huge wave a lot of people died in a very short period of time but mm-hmm. but now life is normalized there's no restrictions it's been ready for more than half a year absolutely it's crazy nightclubs are working and no one wears masks it's it's shocking if you think so but but then you understand i mean and then you can say what is a miracle what we don't know but actually we know much the combine is a the, the composition of developing countries in terms of age mm-hmm. is such that COVID is asymmetrically more damaging for developed countries so in a sense mm. and and developed countries can allow these restrictions well, in Kyrgyzstan, there was this restrictions, yes. and in many other countries. I mean, it, it, I think there was this a huge in Libya or, or in one of the northern African countries. I think there was this huge revolution driven by COVID restrictions because if you are, if you also yep. in services, people can have home office, government is essentially unlimited money thrown both in financial markets and direct support is one reality. The other reality, government doesn't know what to do. They close the economy and people don't have any savings. And they you, you and they rely on daily income, 70% of them. And you know, risk of COVID is nothing compared to risk of dying from hunger from stop of economic activity. So in this case, you could say send them vaccines first, but apparently they already have much they have higher rate of immunity. At least Kyrgyzstan, I don't know. It's one of the poorest countries of the region, uh, if not mm-hmm. the poorest. And it, it was the most liberal in terms of, uh, it was first strict, but then they couldn't maintain it because yeah. people were just, uh, uh, it was uh, very hard so in, in terms of social situation. And then, of course, it was a spike, uh, hospitals were yeah. full, people yeah. were dying. It was very tragic. It, is, it lasts three weeks. And after that, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> I, I'm not lying. I'm, I'm still shocked. I thought I will come back to, I mean, I will fly in traumatized society. No, I'm the only one who's wearing masks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, no, and, and people just saying, well, it's fine. But of course, there's not many people above 80. And that's why mm-hmm. the, the, the percentage, I mean, a lot of young people also that, right? I mean, but, but this rate is not comparable to this really exactly. big peak which yeah. happens in the western countries so maybe in a sense developing countries do we deserve a bit more vaccine complicated topic i i think at least i mean whatever market design does we know that communism doesn't work this we know and <laughs> <laughs> so if if it would be equal share to everyone and these guys for free we probably wouldn't have many vaccines by now so yeah. um I, I do think that uh, inequality is one of the biggest problems nowadays. I do think that COVID is one, uh, brought it to a high extent on all levels, country levels, within country levels, educational levels, anything. And uh, uh, and we should find a way to fight it. And I think there is this, I'm trying to work on this idea of uh, of using mechanism design to kind of create more equalized things it's very broad idea i don't know how to find this trade-off how to not turn into communism so you have to keep up incentives but you create kind of redistribution and i think vaccine is redistributed in one way or another whether it's enough i being honest i don't even know how uh, what is the exactly. amount of transfer but i'm I, I know that something is going on and i'm not an expert to judge whether it's enough or not enough mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's a very interesting point and, and uh, enlightening to the question because I've seen really, uh, yeah, it, it really give a, a good big picture view of the situation. And also, I think it's a, it's a very good way to, to end the, this talk and to, to show that scientific research is, is fascinating, but as everything, it has limitations. And awesome. when you are doing a, a social science and you deal with humans, it's 
so complex that you have to accept that indeed your model will be sometimes representing well reality, but with limitation. And, and sometimes it's really hard to, to just answer very big questions as we are facing now with COVID. So with one clean answer. So No, and I'm definitely not the one who has to do it because I, <laughs> I know only a little bit about, but you know, we all have opinions, why not? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But uh, <laughs> but overall, really, thank you a ton. Uh, thanks for having this, uh, me. It was entertaining. <laughs>